Now to the first special master hearing regarding the documents seized by the FBI from former President Donald Trump's Mar-a-Lago Home and Club. Judge Raymond Deary pressed Trump's attorneys to quickly provide more answers about whether or not Trump declassified the documents marked top secret, whether he declassified them himself. He appeared skeptical about Trump's claim that he had declassified the more than 100 highly sensitive documents in question the ones found at Mar-a-Lago. Judge Deary also signaled he intends to move quickly through the review process of the documents, telling attorneys for both Trump and the DOJ that the court has little time to complete its assigned tasks. Let's bring in Washington Post reporter Perry Stein. She covers the Justice Department and FBI. Also with us, former U.S. attorney Joyce Vance. She's an MSNBC legal analyst. Good to have you both. Perry, just give us the latest in terms of process now. We understand what the judge has said and is indicating he's interested in. But does he full out ask for these things or what happens next? Right. So, so far, he hasn't specifically asked the Trump team to answer any of these questions that I know have made the headlines. But he did say that by Friday, they have to kind of select a vendor, which would be the third party that uploads all these documents so that they can, both parties can view them and the special master can settle any disagreements about privilege. So that's the first step. So that suggests it's moving along. And by next week, early next week, the Justice Department said that they could um, hand over all the non-classified documents in their proper format to be reviewed. So, uh, Joyce, what do you make of what the special master has uh, sort of put out there, Um, not making a ruling or anything like that, but certainly it it appears the the Trump attorneys were a little taken aback by what he's interested in? So as a lawyer, I found this to be profoundly satisfying. Judge Deary did what judges are supposed to do, but what somehow seems to never happen when the former president is involved. He simply applied the facts and the law. And in essence, this is what he said to Trump's lawyers. And it's remarkable, Mm -hmm. Mika. I think you're right to say that they found it startling. They're not used to this sort of treatment in a courtroom. But the judge said, you brought the lawsuit. You bear the burden of proof. The government has made out a prima facie case that these documents are classified, the ones that have classified markings. If you want me to order that these documents be returned to you, you're going to have to come back with some kind of evidence to support your position. You know, this isn't a criminal case where the government bears the burden of proof of guilt beyond a reasonable doubt. It's a civil case brought by Trump. He has to show by the preponderance of evidence that he's entitled to relief. Judge Deary's point was, you have brought forward no evidence, no affidavits, no statements that say that the former president declassified anything. And so Judge Deary strongly implied that the Trump forces were going to be defeated. Um, And that's the rule of law in action. It was a reassuring day for folks who believe in the rule of law. Joyce. There's so many stories swirling around about Trump in various criminal cases. You've got the tax fraud case in New York State, and then certainly the classified documents have been at the forefront of discussion. What do you make of all of these cases, and what do you think is the riskiest case for Donald Trump? So Trump's assessment, and let's be um, clear about this, Trump's assessment is that this is an ongoing witch hunt. And that's the, not a defense in court, but the political story that he tells to his followers. And so with each of these cases, as they come into focus for a few days, as there's activity in them, he uses those to fundraise, he uses those to alienate people, he uses those to undercut confidence in our democratic institutions. And we should be aware that that's a danger. And I think the question, Elise, is whether one of these cases or a group of these cases in combination will ultimately do something to to change the zeitgeist so that people really appreciate that far from being a witch hunt, it's just evidence of robust criminality by the former president across the board. I think In terms of immediacy, if we're looking at criminal cases, the classified documents case probably moves the most quickly and ends up being very damaging precisely because Trump has the burden of coming forward with some evidence, and it'll be tough for him to explain when he doesn't, if he doesn't. 
But civil cases, there are a lot of, uh, you know, cases that are nipping at his heels that combined may have a lot of force. This morning, New York Attorney General Tish James holds a press conference. Some folks believe that that may have something to do with the Trump Organization. Down in Georgia, District Attorney Fonnie Willis is reported to be considering subpoenaing the former president himself. And of course, always hanging over his head is this looming prospect that the Justice Department might succeed in holding him responsible for the insurrection. I'd say what happens overall here is the cross effect between these different investigations. DOJ is likely to develop evidence in the course of the classified documents case that could impact the outcome of the insurrection investigation. Witnesses tend to know about more than one instance of misconduct by someone that they are closely connected to. And so I think it's this tightening of, of the net around Trump that he should be the most worried about. Perry, there are so many developments seemingly by the hour on these various legal fronts. The one storyline that was at the center of the conversation in the immediate aftermath of the FBI search of Mar-a-Lago has sort of fallen by the wayside, and that is the number of threats that the FBI and the Department of Justice, agencies that you cover, were receiving uh, from those on the right upset with what had happened there in Palm Beach. Tell us the latest in terms of just the, the sense of political violence, how much of a part of the discourse that is, and how alarmed are FBI agents to this day that something could happen, particularly as these cases proceed and may end up with an indictment of the former president. Right. So we know immediately after the search of Mar-a-Lago, the FBI reported a number of a spike in threats against their agents. And we know it is still a concern. Even yesterday at the hearing yesterday, um, the DOJ made sure to say any ad additional information, any um, court documents that are released, they really wanted to make sure that the FBI agents' names were redacted. I mean, I think there were some earlier, there were some FBI agents names that got out and they received threats so it is still a concern and we saw that yesterday just in this special master hearing where the DOJ went out of its way to make sure that any name that went out was redacted so that FBI agents did not receive these threats and there was no pushback from the Trump's legal team on this point. All right, The Washington Post, Perry Stein and former U.S. Attorney Joyce Vance, thank you both very much for your coverage and analysis this morning.